Hi, TBC. Thanks for joining us for worship today. If you're joining us for the first time, we want to welcome you. Let us know you're here by commenting in the chat or by visiting our website to fill out an online info card. We'd love to connect you to community at TBC. Also, we invite you to visit our biblical resources library at thevillagechapel.com slash resources. There you'll find a curated library of books, videos, and articles that will help you think biblically in all of life. Well, we're so grateful you're here with us today as we continue our study of First and Second Kings. Now let's join the service in the chapel. Chapel. Hey, can we thank him one more time, Zach and Maggie and the band this morning to get us started. Let's all stand together as we come to the Lord to worship him this morning. Delight to bring him praise. 
the Son of thy love For Jesus who died and is now gone alone Sing hallelujah, thine the glory Hallelujah, amen Hallelujah, thine the glory Revive us again kids, you guys are dismissed. Everybody else, let's take a moment and greet those around us. Village Chapel. My name is Emily Bailey, and I am privileged to serve as your communications and creative director. And I have the privilege of giving you some announcements. So let's take a look at those. The first one is we are hiring. So if there is anyone that you know, or it might be yourself who is interested in looking for some part-time work, we are specifically in need of members of our production and AV team. So if you know a thing or two about video, audio, or computer slides operation, we would absolutely love to talk with you about being on the team. We are also looking for childcare workers that can serve midweek for Bible studies and extra events. You can go to thevillagechapel.com slash hiring to read the specific details and to get in contact with us. The second announcement I have for you today is that Lunchtime Talks is coming back and we will be starting on September the 27th. If you work around the Nashville area, we would love to have you for this mid week lunchtime Bible study. It's 45 minutes. It starts right at noon, and we will be taking a look at the minor prophets. So it will be a selection of those, and you can sign up for that. We want to make sure to provide enough lunch for you, and so you can sign up at thevillagechapel.com slash events. Thirdly, 
Next Saturday is our fall picnic, and we're grateful that many of you have already signed up for that. You can go to thevillagechapel.com slash events to find out the details. What I really wanted to mention to you today is the issue of parking at Dragon Park. Uh, There is a lot of street parking around there, but there's not a designated parking lot. So we are recommending that you drop off your food, your family, and your fun items, that was for you, Jim, or your lawn chair. I couldn't come up with an F for that. Drop those off at the park and then send someone here to park at our parking lot. And Google Maps says it's a 0.5 mile, mostly flat walk. (laughs) And I think the weather is looking like upper 70s. So let's pray to that end. And we will have a glorious day and a nice walk to the park next Saturday. We look forward to seeing you there. And finally, today is our very first Meet and Connect. If you are new to the Village Chapel within the last few months, we would love to meet and connect with you just below the chapel in the TVC offices. Some of our staff will be there after both of the services today to help you find ways to get plugged in here at the church. We will be doing these every second Sunday. So if you miss it this week, we'll do it next month as well. Well, that is all the announcements I have for you, but we have a special announcement that will happen on the screen. I'll direct your attention there. Hello, folks. It's our privilege to share some exciting development plans here at TVC. Over the past few years, the TVC leadership has been praying, dreaming, and planning for a multi-season outdoor gathering space for adults and a secure play area for our TVC kids. These design spaces will help to foster community and withness, and we can't wait to show you what's planned. The development of a 30 by 30 foot pavilion and continuous play area will begin soon, just outside these doors. We like to think of this new extension of our facility as an outdoor fellowship hall that will expand the use of the living room. We look forward to how the Lord will use this new outdoor space in between services on Sunday mornings, for small groups, for weddings, events, potlucks, and so much more. The Servant Leadership Council has allocated resources and planned for this capital expense for several years. We invite you to participate by continuing your faithful giving at TVC for the ongoing day-to-day operations of the ministry. What a great joy to see more worship of God, more lives transformed, and more kingdom living right here in Hillsboro Village for generations to come. Wow, that's, that's worth responding to. I heard that collective gasp when you saw the graphic and heard the words continuous play. What, what, an, amazing, uh, what an amazing thing coming there. Um, quick announcement before I lead us in our prayers this morning. Uh, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago that we have our care and equip semester beginning tonight. That's here at the church. Grief share and divorce care. Uh, there's still time to sign up. We actually don't close registration on those. Um, there's still time to sign up. So if you would, if you're, if you're interested in that today, please either sign up at thevillagechapel.com slash events, care and equip. Uh, there's a link with a form, or you can email me directly, tom at uh, thevillagechapel.com. <clears throat> we would love for uh, people to take advantage of that if that is something that uh, would be beneficial. Uh, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, you are good, you are powerful. Lord, we know you love us, and we trust you with these uh, many needs in our congregation and in the world around us this morning, Lord. Our TVC ministry prayer focus this morning is the TVC facility team under the leadership of Jeremy Martin. Lord, we are so thankful for Jeremy's organizational skill and dedication to serving all users of this historic building. Uh, We ask that you would continue to bless each person on this team with a zeal for this particularly important work. Lord, be with them. Lord, our TVC vocation this morning is finance, banking, accounting, CPAs, all things money-related. We're so grateful for the many in our congregation and in our community who are not only gifted in these areas, but also 
infuse their industry with integrity and with biblical ethic. Uh, we pray for continued creativity in this field that affects so much of our world, Lord. Our TVC mission prayer focus this morning is Convoy of Hope. Convoy of Hope is a faith-based organization with a driving passion to feed the world through children's feeding initiatives, community outreach, and disaster response. In partnership with local churches, businesses, civic organizations, and government agencies, Convoy strategically offers help and hope to communities around the world. Convoy of Hope is currently serving those affected by Hurricane Idalia, the fires in Maui, and many others uh, nationally and internationally. Lord Father, uh, we ask you to continue to be generous and near to this organization and the many that they serve. Lord, we are brokenhearted and grieving the many lives lost in uh, the disaster in Morocco, Lord, this, this horrible earthquake. Uh, Lord, we know there are many grieving families there. Reports continue to come in, and the death toll has now surpassed 2,000 people. Lord, have mercy. Many uh, in Marrakesh are sleeping on the streets at night for fear of returning to their homes. We pray for protection for the citizens there, uh, for the many response and relief workers who are already in the country and are on their way. Uh, thank you, Lord, that, uh, that there's uh, so much faithful giving here at TVC that we've already been able to uh, make a specific donation to one of our trusted disaster relief organizations. We pray that you would be in that effort, Lord. We pray that you would be present. We pray that you would be near. Lord, we pray for uh, you to be glorified in all of this, Lord. A regular TVCer has requested that we continue to uh, pray for the people of re Ukraine, Lord. Uh, this war continues to claim thousands of lives every day. Um, and many of us are starting to accept this terrible conflict as a, as a reality between these nations. Um, we ask that this war would be over as soon as possible. We ask that this, the daily deaths would stop, that healing would begin. Help us, Father, to desire peace as much as we hate injustice, Lord. We pray for Casey, daughter of TV seers Nancy and Dwayne Murphy. Casey is pregnant with her first child and this past week experienced some complications at 30 weeks. That is a, a scary thing, Lord, we know for everyone. And we, we do praise you, Lord, that Casey and the baby are now stable. The plan is to keep Casey in the hospital until uh, delivery by C-section in four weeks. Uh, we ask that Casey and the baby will remain stable until this baby is ready uh, and fully developed for delivery, Lord. Pray that you would keep your hand on uh, mom and baby, Lord, and be with uh, Nancy and Dwayne, as I'm sure that they are stressed and concerned, Lord. Bring them calm and peace. We continue to lift up TVC or Donna Dean as she recovers in a Maryland hospital after a tree fell on her tent while she was camping there in Maryland. In addition to several broken vertebrae, she continues to have issues with her spleen. Even after a procedure earlier uh, this past week, she is requiring supplemental oxygen. She's worried about possibly needing a splenectomy. Lord, I know that she is uh, stressed about um, the care plan there. We pray that she can remain calm and hopeful. And we know that she's anxious to get back to Tennessee, Lord. Um, we ask for healing for her. We pray that you would touch her body, Lord. We ask for doctors to be wise and compassionate. Um, we just ask that you would be in that situation, Lord, and, and bring her home soon, Lord, so that uh, she can have some semblance of comfort and normalcy as she uh, heals, Lord. We lift up Judy Clayton, mother of TVC or Paige Clayton. Judy had a stroke last week while Paige was out of the country. Um, I'm thankful, Lord, for last night's report that Judy is swallowing and is talking a bit and is alert. Uh, Judy also has pneumonia and some heart AFib. Paige is in the process of trying to get back to her but won't be able to get back to Atlanta until Tuesday night, and I know that she is... Um, she is stressed about that. We ask that you, um, Lord, would bring her home safely. We ask that you'd be near to both Judy and Paige. 
Calm their hearts, Lord, their minds. Um, We pray for Judy's highest good that will most glorify you in this situation, Lord. We ask you to heal her, Lord. Elizabeth Oliver has asked for prayer for her boss, Matthew Powell, who's having scans done Tuesday to see if he can uh, move to a less aggressive form of chemo. And the hope is for that to be a pill form of treatment. His scans in July showed that his chemo is working better than the doctors expected. So thank you for this, Lord. Meanwhile, Elizabeth and others in Matthew's life are in awe of the way you have used this situation to draw people closer to him. So they are truly praying for full healing and a miracle. And Lord, we also ask for this. We pray that you would call every one of Matthew's rebellious cells into obedience to you, Lord. Rico Thomas asks for prayer for a surgery he's having on Wednesday. It's an endoscopy and dilation of his eustachian tube with a one to two week recovery. Lord, this sounds like a situation that has the potential to be uncomfortable in so many ways, both now and after the procedure, but we pray for relief and normalcy for Rico as his medical team engages in this procedure, Lord. Be with all involved in this, we pray. John Hartley has requested prayer for his niece, Harriet Hartley, who's having surgery next week for bile duct cancer, which is rare for a 22-year-old. Lord, give this young lady courage. Be with her medical team and all those who care for her, Lord. Lord, we pray uh, for the persecuted church in Israel, in the areas of the West Bank and Gaza. This is a decades-long conflict between the Israeli government and Palestinian authorities over the city of Jerusalem. And the land and the status of Palestinian refugees remains among the world's most volatile issues. During this conflict, many Jews and Muslims have been coming to faith in Christ despite their religion's instructions to reject the gospel. Christian activity is routinely opposed by Islamists and occasionally by ultra-Orthodox and other anti-missionary Jews in Israel proper. Christian converts from Islam in the West Bank and Gaza face violence at the hands of their family members and local Palestinian authorities. Lord, protect them. Give them boldness and strength, Lord. Christians in Israel proper often experience family rejection, low social standing, and limited hope of job advancement. Lord, we pray that you would be all that they need, Lord, be their portion. We know it is no casual thing to follow you in this part of the world, Lord. Specifically, we ask um, that you would be with Messianic congregations that have been increasingly targeted by anti-missionary groups. We pray that you would be with Christian families in the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip who face continual pressure. We pray for Christian converts from Islam and Palestinian areas, especially those who have lost jobs. Provide for them, we ask. We pray for young believers from Orthodox Jewish backgrounds trying to restart their lives with very little education. And we pray for African congregations and other ethnic churches that face discrimination in this area. Lord, we know that, uh, that there is a peace coming when you sit on the throne that, um, that will be better than anything we could ask for here on earth, Lord. But we, we do ask for uh, peace in this region, Lord. We pray that you would continue to help our hearts and minds to desire that. Build your church, Father, in Nashville and abroad. Protect your people. Give us a voice to speak truth, beauty, and the gospel wherever and whenever opportunity allows. Give us the appropriate burden for those who need to know you, Lord, and for those who suffer for knowing you, Lord. We trust that our times are in your hands, that you are a sovereign God who has a plan to set all things right one day. Lord, your heart breaks at what our heart breaks for Until that day, we ask your Holy Spirit to be with us, to lead us and guide us into every good endeavor. Lord, we pray for our pastor, Jim, this morning as he teaches from chapter 2 of 1 Kings. Thank you for his preparation. Speak through him, we ask, as we prepare our hearts to receive in this new series, Lord. Father, continue to bind our hearts and spirits together as one as we pray this prayer that you taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, if you're able, as we continue to sing to our Lord this prayer. We sing. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Typically, when we do our, our catechesis, our creedal statement, we stay standing, but I'd like to ask you to be seated because I have a, a little announcement. Tony and Susie Higginbotham, where are you? Can you stand up, please? You guys, this is their 57th anniversary today. <laughs> Woo! Come on! You guys are, are such a picture of faithfulness to each other and to God, self-sacrificing love for each other. We're grateful, grateful for you. Um, so let's read our, our creedal statement together. This comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, and it's just a beautiful statement on the faithfulness of God. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That the eternal Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and all that is in them, still upholds and governs them by his eternal counsel and providence. In him I trust so completely as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul and will also turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this life. He is able to do so as Almighty God and willing also as a faithful Father. Amen. I like that one, Matt. That was really good. Thank you for that. Morning, everyone. Hey, uh, let me add two prayers. Lord, uh, pray for my wife right now. She's feeling a little under the weather today. Just lift her up. Uh, and based on what we just said, I'm reminded our confidence is in you. Um, there's not one square inch of the entire creation that doesn't belong to you. You know exactly what's going on. Trust you, and uh, thank you so much that she looked a little bit improved today, so grateful for that. Pray for also for my mom, who was in the hospital as of last night, and uh, I just pray for her that she'll be watching. She's probably watching all of us right now, so pray for her and ask you to give her a speedy recovery. Give those doctors great wisdom. Thank you for my brothers who so faithfully take good care of her to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that. We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel. We do have extra copies. If you would like one to follow along, this is another good day to have the text in front of you. So uh, raise your hand up real high and somebody will drop one off if you want a paper copy. Uh, you can probably see up on the screen there as well the QR code and uh, you, you may uh, feel free to access uh, the house network as well if you would just like to follow along in the text online. The QR code will also give you the notes and quotes here for uh, today's study. Despite King David being uh, on his deathbed, feeble and frail, despite the older brother Adonijah's attempted coup d'etat, the older brother of Solomon, that is, uh, Solomon had now become king, just as Yahweh had promised and had planned. Here is the story of an uncertain and shaky kingdom that was being reset or reestablished, redirected, if you will. The Hebrew uh, word, the verb that's used four different times in this chapter, chapter 2, is kun, K-U-N, and it means established. You'll see it in verse 12, verse 24, verse 45, and verse 46. So it really serves to, as a thread, thematic thread throughout chapter 2, which is another really bumpy ride, okay? So we're going we're gonna to take this again, just like we always do, but it's a bumpy ride. I hope you'll sit up straight and pay close attention. Yahweh guides uh, and establishes his choice for Israel's king with Solomon on the throne, setting up the lineage that will one day lead to and include David's greater, greatest son, Jesus himself, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. But this story does raise some interesting questions, and uh, as it did last week for us, they might include these questions, and perhaps you've had these questions before. Can God be trusted? Does God know what he is doing? What has God actually promised to do, and does he have both the power and the will to actually do that, fulfill his promises. Uh, this is all really important, especially as regards uh, what we're calling this study, which is uh, um, uh, the king of redemption history. I love that. And then today we're going to call it establishing God's kingdom here for chapter 2. Would you look at the text with me? As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, and then we're going to get for the next few verses here uh, down to verse 9. These are David's final words to Solomon. And remember, he's chosen Solomon over Adonijah. Adonijah tried to do this coup d'etat, and he tried to establish himself, assert himself as king. David heard about it through Nathan and Bathsheba. David shut it down immediately, anointed 
um, or had uh, Solomon anointed king. So he pulls Solomon to his bedside, and here's what David's final words are. He says, I'm going the way of all the earth. David, back in 3,000 years ago, knew what we all know right now, that out of every 100 persons born on the earth, 100 of us will also leave the earth in death. And he knew this. He knew the statistics. It was overwhelming. Uh, Along the way, there is one who got back up from death, not just in the temporary resuscitation, but in what we call the resurrection. Uh, He is King David's greatest son, uh, Jesus, and the one we trust in. But as he pulls Solomon before, he says, I'm going to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And then verse 5 kind of takes an interesting turn. Now you also know that Joab, Joab was King David's commander, general of the armies. Even before he, King David became king, when there was this sort of guerrilla band of, of guys following David throughout the wilderness as King Saul was chasing to kill King, uh, to chase in, uh, David and kill him, Joab was was faithful to David in the sense that he was the commander of David's armies. Well, David, and this all kind of went sour over the last few years, you know what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace. He did it in peacetime, in other words. And he put the blood of war on his belt, about his waist, and on his sandals, on his feet. So act according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. It's interesting to me that he doesn't mention that Joab also killed Absalom. That's not even mentioned here. I don't know why. Couldn't find a Bible commentator that knew why. I found a couple that said, we don't know why. So I'm going (laughs) to, I'll quote them. We don't know why. We'll have to wait till later to find out at some point. And then there's this another little turn, verse seven. But show kind here's this remember, dying words of David to his son Solomon. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite. Raise your hand if you know Barzillai the Gileadite. Okay. So we studied first and second Samuel together, and all the way back in there, you'll read of Barzillai the Gileadite a few times, but first, especially in 2 Samuel 17, uh, he's a part of Uh, As Absalom tries to take the the throne from David, David uh, chooses to leave Jerusalem and retreat. And along the way, he he and his his band of sort of merry followers, they are uh, treated uh, in a healthy way by Barzillai the Gileadite. He gives them food and supplies as they're traveling, even though Absalom is the apparent, you know, in another coup d'etat is going to take Jerusalem. So he says, show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gilead. I let them be among those who eat at your table, for they assisted me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Verse 8. Behold, there is with you Shimei, the son of Gera the Benjamite of Bahurim. Bahurim. Now it was he who cursed me with a violent curse on the day I went to Mahanaim. This is in 2 Samuel um, 15 or 16. And as David's leave, I mean, as Absalom's coming and David's leaving Jerusalem, there, you know, he's marching along the road, going up the, uh, kid, down the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives. There's this guy here named Shimei, and he's like a wild, crazy guy. He's hectoring David all along the way, throwing dirt clods and rocks and stones and cursing him in every, I'm just treating him, abusing him publicly in front of everybody, this guy, okay? So David hasn't forgotten that. Um, it, it says, he who has cursed me with a violent curse on the day I went to Mahanaim, But when he came down to me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. See, after Absalom is booted and David is coming back, 
This guy, Shimei, goes, runs back to David and does a big apology. And David was just in a very merciful mood as he's coming back. And he just caught up in all of that moment of, oh, we're going back to the palace. Oh, good. He, he said, nobody's going to die today. And so he, does, he tells him he wouldn't put him to death. But now he's telling, David remembers this. He hasn't let go of it. And he's going to tell Solomon, by the way, you take care of him for me. Okay? Um, I said, I won't put you to death by the sword. Now, therefore, do not let him go unpunished, for you are a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do to him, and you will bring his gray hair down to Sheol with blood. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Okay, verses 1 through 10. To me, it kind of sounds like almost two different people, but it's not. This is David's dying words, and it's basically in two parts. Part one, don't forget to have your quiet time. Part two, kill all those people I don't like, but be nice to that one guy who was nice to me that one time. That's craziness. <laughs> but I really, those first four verses, amazing. If you want to mine for some gold, there's like 10 things there. I'll get back to that in a second. But we've got to read the rest of this chapter. I'll come back to it in a second. But there's, there's some really powerful stuff in those first four verses about uh, King David's charge to Solomon. Verse 11, the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years, seven years. Uh, he reigned in Hebron, and 33 years he reigned in Jerusalem. That's true. Before he moved to Jerusalem and took over the throne, he was uh, seven years there in Hebron, which is to the south and west of Jerusalem. So 33 years he reigned in Jerusalem. Solomon sat on the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was, here it is, firmly established. Kun, K-U-N in Hebrew. This is, I think, the theme here, establishing God's kingdom. Verse 13 all the way to 43 are a description of how Solomon uh, responds and how this all kind of works itself out. Let me fly through it, okay? Adonijah, the son of Haggith, Haggith was his mother, who was one of the eight wives of David, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, okay? She said, remember, Solomon's the king now. Do you come peacefully, Bathsheba says. And she had every reason to be cautious about his approach. And he said, peacefully. And I would say, don't always accept what people say when they say that kind of thing, <laughs> because you'll see what happens here. He said, I have something to say to you. And she said, speak. So he said, you know that the kingdom was mine and that all Israel expected me to be king. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brothers, for it was from the Lord. And I'd rather have translated that as him saying, I guess that's what God wanted. He just doesn't seem to have bought in because you'll see in a second. I'm making one request of you, Bathsheba. Do not refuse me. And she said, speak. And then he said, please speak to Solomon the king, for he will not refuse you, that he may give me Abishag the Shunammite as a wife. Remember, Abishag is the one from the last chapter when David was old and cold and in his bed, and he couldn't keep him warm. They had all the blankets of the world on him, and some of his courtier, uh, some of his members of his court said, let's find a beautiful young woman that she could be a bed warmer for him, you know? And so she comes, verse 4 tells us he did not have relations with her, so we know that it was, she literally came in and, and uh, for David at that stage in his life, for whatever reason, he isn't uh, falling to the lust of the flesh. He is, he's, he, he's being cared for by uh, Abishag, but he never slept with her. But she was considered among the women who would be like a concubine of his at that point. Here comes Adonijah asking for her hand. And um, he, please speak to Solomon the king that he would give me Abishag the Shunammite as a wife. Bathsheba said, very well, I will speak to the king for you. The heart always makes a convert of the head. I think Bathsheba shows herself in some ways, <clears throat> perhaps here, to, want, to, to have felt, perhaps she felt bad about the fact that Adonijah, who was by cultural rights the eldest living son of David, by cultural rights he should have been the next king. But as we've seen throughout the pages of Scripture, God, Yahweh doesn't always behave by cultural standards, does he? He sometimes does things in a reverse kind of a way, an unexpected way. 
Um, and indeed, this is one of those occasions. But for whatever reason, Bathsheba says, I'll speak to the king. Here, verse 19, Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. The king rose to meet her, bowed before her, sat on his throne. And then he had a throne set the, uh, for the king's mother. She sat on his right. So she's got a real place in his life. And even there in the, 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 the royal room, if you will, the, the, the court if you will. She said, I'm making one small request of you. Do not refuse me. The king said to her, ask my mother, for I will not refuse you. Probably not the wisest moment of Solomon's life. Um, but remember, he hasn't asked for wisdom yet. That's coming next week, so we'll, we'll, we'll see him grow in wisdom, <laughs> okay? Uh, so she said, let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as a wife. King Solomon answered and said to his mother, and why are you asking Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him also the kingdom, for he is my older brother, even for him, for Abiathar the priest, and for Joab the son of Zeruiah. And see, these were co-conspirators with Adonijah, uh, Abiathar the priest, Joab the son of Zeruiah. So King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, this is in front of Bathsheba, may God do so to me and more also if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Now, therefore, as the Lord lives who has established me and set me on the throne of David, my father, and who has made me a house as he promised, surely Adonijah will be put to death today. So King Solomon sent Benaiah. This is uh, going to become his Joab, if you will. So Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him, meaning he fell upon Adonijah, so that he died. 26. Then Abiathar the priest said to the king, or, to, or excuse me, then to Abiathar the priest, the king said, here he's going to treat Abiathar with just uh, wisdom, I think, here in this case. Go to Enathoth, just a, this is a little town just outside of uh, Jerusalem. To your own field. By the way, this is the hometown of Jeremiah the prophet a number of years later. So I, lo I love when you triangulate some of these stories and you start to see the way this is a very small place, Israel. It's about as big as the state of New Jersey. And uh, so he says to Abiathar, go to Anathoth to your own field for you deserve to die. But I will not put you to death at this time because you carry the ark of the Lord God before my father David and because you were afflicted in every way with which my father was afflicted. So Solomon dismissed Abiathar from being priest to the Lord in order to fulfill the word of the Lord, which he had spoken concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. You can, again, you can jump back and you can see in some of your margins, some of your Bibles will have the references so you can go back and look over their stories. But basically what Solomon does here is instead of killing Abiathar like he did Adonijah, um, he simply fires Abiathar from being priest and sends him back to his home. Verse 28, now the news to, came to Joab, for, and you can imagine the word is spreading fast that Solomon is cleaning house. Now the news came to Joab, for Joab had followed Adonijah, although he had not followed Absalom. Joab fled to the tent of the Lord, took hold of the horns of the altar. This is in the tabernacle, okay? The temple has not been built yet. And it was told King Solomon that Joab had fled to the tent of the Lord. Behold, he is beside the altar. Then Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, go fall upon him. And that means go kill him, okay? If you need me to make that clear, that's exactly what that means, okay? Uh, Benaiah came to the tent of the Lord and said to him, thus the king has said, come out. But he said, no, for I will die here. And Benaiah brought the king word again, saying, thus spoke Joab, and thus he answered me. And the king said to him, do as he has spoken and fall upon him and bury him, that you may remove from me and from my father's house the blood which Joab shed without cause. The Lord will return his blood on his own head because he fell upon two men more righteous and better than he and killed them with the sword while my father David did not know it. Abner, the son of Ner, commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Je uh, Jether, commander of the army of Judah. Again, he doesn't mention Absalom here. The, uh, so shall their blood return on the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever, but to David and his descendants and his house and his throne may there be peace from the Lord forever. So Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, 
went up and fell upon him and put him to death, and he was buried at his own house in the wilderness. And the king appointed Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army, the army in his place, that is, in Joab's place. And the king appointed Zadok, the priest, in the place of Abiathar. Remember the one who's been fired? Zadok has now taken his place. Now the king sent to and called for Shimei and said to him, Build for yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there. Do not go out from there to any place. For it will happen on the day you go out and cross over the brook Kidron, you will know for certain that you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. So you're going to li- I'm going to give you the opportunity to live, just as he's done to Abiathar, but I'm going to confine you under house arrest, essentially, is what's happening here. And just like Abiathar has a choice, Shimei has a choice, okay? And we see this throughout the Old Testament. These folks have some choices, and they just keep making bad choices, including Solomon, um, along the way. For it will happen the day you go out and cross over the brook, Kidron, you will know for certain that you will surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. Shimei then said to the king, thy word is good. Uh, as my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. So he's agreeing to this whole thing. He is fully aware. It's very clear. And Shimei lived in Jerusalem many days. So some time passes. It came about at the end of three years that two of the servants of Shimei ran away to Ashish, uh, son of Maacah, king of Gath. This is a Philistine city. And they told Shimei, saying, Behold, your servants are in Gath. Gath was the hometown of Goliath. You know, some of you will remember that. And then Shimei rose and saddled his donkey, and he went to Gath, to Achish, to look for his servants. And Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath. And it was told Solomon that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had returned. And the king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, Did I not make it? You swear by the Lord and solemnly warn you, saying, You will know for certain that on the day you depart and go anywhere, you shall surely die. And you said to me, The word which I have heard is good. Why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment which I have laid on you? The king also said to Shimei, You know all the evil which you acknowledge in your heart, which you did to my father David. Therefore, the Lord shall return your evil on your own head." But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be blessed, or established rather, there's that word again, before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and fell upon him so that he died. Thus, the kingdom was established, Kun, in the hands of Solomon. Okay. Like last week, I'm going to say what you're all thinking. What? What? is this doing in the Bible? And how can we go from have good devotions to take care of business for me? I mean, it's almost, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like, like David is the dying mafia don. <laughs> Yo, my boy, take care of business for me. And it sounds like Solomon's going, okay, pops. <laughs> And he's the original wise guy in that regard, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, he does that kind of thing. And it's just one of those kind of chapters where you're, you, know, you can find yourself struggling. What was, the, what was the promise of the Lord as regards? Because I think this is, this is important for us to understand. Um, what was that promise? I'm going to throw it up on the screen for you. I will uh, raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I'll make his kingdom strong. This is the promise the Lord is making to David. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with a rod like any father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time. Your throne will be secure forever. This, is, fi- this finds its ultimate fulfillment in Solomon. and it, I mean, excuse me, its immediate fulfillment in Solomon and its ultimate fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus. You say, I don't see Solomon's name there. Okay, let's go to 1 Chronicles 28, where we read, of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons. This is David. He, the Lord, has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, your son Solomon is the one who shall build my house and my courts, for I've for I have chosen him to be a son to me, and I will be a father to him. I will establish his kingdom forever if he resolutely performs my commandments and my ordinances. And so here we have 
I think the promises of God clarified. Um, I think what's important for us to be able to do as Bible students ourselves, living so many 3,000 years later, roughly 3,000 years later, is we look at the genre of literature. This is prophetic historical narrative. And um, we must, as we interpret it, um, we must allow it to speak as it wants to to us. And some of this will be very specific to certain people at certain times and places. And we need to interpret it and apply it when it speaks that way. Um, Some of the other things that we find in prophetic historical narrative will be more like timeless truths. And we read them and we do the good job, the hard work of rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I want to draw a distinction between The first part, have some good devotions. There's more to it than just that. I don't mean to trivialize it. And this other stuff that we're reading here, there's some very specific people, and to establish God's kingdom, the current version of the iteration of God's kingdom with Solomon as king, there had to be some enemies evidently removed. Let's look first at the part that makes a whole lot of easy sense to us, advice regarding character and spiritual life. Be strong. What does that mean? It's very important, uh, two words. It's the kind of thing the Lord uh, would say through his uh, angel to Joshua before he goes into the promised land. Be strong is the kind of thing a father would say to a son who is about to go on a dangerous mission or journey or that that sort of thing. So the Lord, uh, through David, is saying to Solomon, be strong. You will have resistance. There will be tension. There will be times where the resistance will come from outside and other times the, the temptation will come from inside. The same thing happened with the church in the book of Acts. If you study Acts at all, you know it had external pressure, people trying to shut it down all the time, and it also had internal tension, uh, some infighting, some mixed motives, uh, some people struggling for power and position and all that sort of thing, and that happens. Um, But be strong is important. Show yourself a man is not a call for what some in our modern day might call toxic masculinity. And I don't know where these terms come from. I, 10 years ago, I didn't find that term 10 years ago. And I haven't been able to find the toxic femininity anywhere. Um, but there are these terms. And there are some really mean men. And, and I don't mean to uh, um, uh, say that there aren't any mean men, just like I wouldn't say there aren't any mean women. Um, and mean-spirited and trying to take advantage. And, uh, and it's wrong. Okay, um, but be strong and show yourself a man. Uh, we, we should not undercut and dismiss the call to biblical manhood, nor should we ever undercut the call to biblical womanhood for women. Um, we're not confused about the two. Uh, the Bible is very clear about how God created human persons. And so we don't want to dismiss that, and at the same time, we want to be loving and careful and kind to all those in our culture that struggle with some of these issues. I, myself, uh, have some friends and some loved ones uh, who struggle with these things, and so I, I don't mean to trivialize it, but I, at the same time, I can't, I, I don't want to, just for the sake of everybody's feelings, dismiss what's said here. Solomon needed to be strong, and he needed to show himself a man. Third, keep the charge of the Lord your God. If the question comes, what does it mean to show yourself a man? Here comes the answer. It's not get up and scream at people. It's not go down, take a bunch of steroids, lift a bunch of weights so that you can prove you're the strongest dude on the, on the block. It's not you're going to go out and be the World Wrestling Federation champion or whatever. It's not that. To be a man in the biblical sense means to keep the charge of the Lord your God. Uh, and for, for husbands, I just, in my study in Ephesians, in my, my podcast, we just came through chapter 5. Man, it means laying down your life for your wife as Christ laid down his life for the church. 
That's what it means to be a good husband. Um, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm 45 years in. We're, we're still figuring all of that out. But, but keep the charge of the Lord your God, which includes walking in his ways. In other words, not just verbal consent to the existence of God, but actually walking that out in every bit of your life. It's really, really important. And that looks like keeping God's statutes, His laws, His commandments, His ordinances, His rules, His testimonies, His admonitions. I love this little string of synonyms. It's as if David is saying to Solomon, it's not unclear what God's will is for you. Now, in our day and time, we all are so concerned about God's will as it regards our, our job or, or which school we should go to or, or should I marry this person or should I date this person or what, should I live or what? And we have all these events that we're planning our entire identity and life around. And God's will for us is expressly revealed and it has more to do with our character than with how much money we make or where we go to school or how popular we are. It's really about following his ordinances, keeping his statutes, his laws, his commandments, so that we will be that group of people who have been set apart by God in a dark world, shining as lights brightly as witnesses and testimonies to the Lord, according to what is written in the law of Moses, number six up there. In other words, it's not just up to the individual. It's not, do what, you do you, would be the way the world we live in says it. And no, the Bible says, no, you do Jesus. You be like Jesus. You live like Jesus would. Ultimately, that's where this all goes. Because he's the fulfillment of all of God's commands, all of God's statutes, all of God's testimonies. All of this points forward to the Lord Jesus. And so we're supposed to live like Jesus would live in any instance, in any case. That you may succeed in all that you do wherever you turn. There is a... a, a a way of describing the kind of success God views as success. It's called blessed. Jesus uses it over and over again in the Beatitudes. Blessed, flourishing would be the soul, even the soul that suffers, even the soul that has turned itself completely over to the Lord, His will, His ways, his wisdom. Yes, that's how we find the blessed life, um, that we may succeed according to the way God would define success and that we may carry out. And I love this, that the Lord may carry out his promise. This is the purpose for Solomon, for, for David is telling Solomon, for which you should do all of these things. We're invited to join Yahweh in the work he's doing as the king of redemption history. Uh, Dale Ralph Davis would say, law obedience is the condition for promise enjoyment. I like that. Law obedience is this condition for promise enjoyment. So we learned so much here. And Dale Ralph Davis goes on to say, kingdom stability is not anchored in our experiences or our profession, not in our education or pedigree, not in our ministerial achievements, but only in obedience to the clear word we have long possessed. We have, God's not left us in the dark. See, that's what I love that David said that this is according to the, the laws of Moses that have been written down. It's, it's not just you kind of make a way for you the way you want everything to... No, that's not it at all. And I don't know about you, but I, for one, I'm so greatly relieved about that. Maybe you're not, but I am. Why? Because I don't think freedom is found in me just getting to do whatever I want to do. I, don't, I think that's false freedom. I think my heart, my wanter, as we've called it here before, is actually broken and misguided. And I often want things that aren't good for me. And frankly, I often want things that aren't good for you. Or others, let me put it that way. I don't mean you specifically. Um, but you can probably think of some people that you frankly don't want things that are good for them. Because you're mad at them. You're holding on to anger and bitterness. You're mad at them. You don't want, you're, you, and the simple trivial version is you're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off. You want the Lord to bless them, but with a brick <laughs> or a bale of hay or something. You just don't, your wishes aren't good for them is the thing. 
Um, and it's not, just, it's not just that we want our team to win, although maybe it is that way in, in some of the political games that are being played in the world in which we live. Um, my team, no matter what, you know. Um, I don't think that's the way we're to be. I think we're to turn this all over to the Lord, and there's where true freedom is found. Because no matter who's in the state house or the White House, it doesn't matter to me. Why? Because God's on the throne of my life. I belong to him lock, stock, and barrel. There's nothing anybody in the state house or White House can do that's going to take that away from me. So I'm really free, you see. I'm completely free. This is why the Apostle Paul could sing hymns in jail. He was chained to a smelly old Roman soldier. He was in prison, and he's writing Philippians, with, using the word joy, 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 over and over again. And he's talking about the joy of the Lord is my strength. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice while a rat is nibbling on his toes. He's joyful. That's freedom. That's real freedom right there. Um, I love here that we see the kingdom of God will be established in us as we study God's word. Solomon, study God's word. Know it. Testimony. He uses all those synonyms to say, you need to study God's Word. That's why we at the Village Chapel study through books of the Bible. It's what's really good for us, and we want the kingdom of God established in us. This is how we gain God's perspective and God's wisdom. This is how we discern God's will and God's ways. We, we get in His Word. As I said last week, um, lessons from redemption's history uh, in the past will bring us wisdom for the present and guidance for the future. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's so important. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's so important. What's your view of Scripture? Nice inspirational book or the word of God for us? The platform for belief and behavior for you personally. The Scotch Catechism, uh, Lewis said, uh, says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify. To, uh, in commanding us to glorify God, God is inviting us to enjoy Him. Do you think of God that way? He's not just the rule v- machine up there. He wants you to enjoy Him. He wants you to find this freedom that I'm talking about. Because God is infinitely and supremely glorious and praiseworthy. Glorifying God is exactly what we should do. We were designed for this. We were designed for Him as worshipers. And you're all worshiping something. It's either God or something that isn't God. But you make no mistake, you are worshiping every day, every moment, all 86,400 seconds of the 24-hour period we call Sunday. We are worshiping something. I like Packer too. He said, if you ask, why is this happening in your life? No light may come. But if you ask, how am I going to glorify God right now? Ah, there will be an answer. I love that. I think that changes my view of literally everything. I've got to hurry. Um, Number one, establishing God's kingdom. Uh, It's established despite the formidable formidable opposition from without. I think we see that here in all the, what do, I mean, what do we do with those verses that, we're, that have all that violence and all that retributive justice, if you want to go? Some will see this, by the way, as vengeance. Some will see this as justice. Which is it? Honestly, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, it seems to me, though, that I have to remove some of the enemies of my spiritual life out of my life, and it doesn't mean I should go kill them, but it might mean that I set aside some relationship, like I, like I stop hanging out with some people, because why? Because they lead me astray, and I don't have the strength to resist what they want me to do. So there may be some people There may be some places, there may be some props in your life that need to go if you're going to grow spiritually. And I can't can't tell you what those are. I don't know. I just know that that seems to have been the case for me. And so we see that the opposition from without um, um, is it doesn't have to stop the establishment of God's kingdom in your heart and in mine. 
I think that's important. We see that here. God's kingdom will be established despite significant failures within. And in David, we see a, a guy who's a failure. In Solomon, we see a guy who's a failure. In Adonijah, we see another guy. I mean, there isn't anybody in this chapter that's the hero. As a matter of fact, there's nobody in the entire Bible except Jesus who's the hero, ultimately. All human beings need a Savior, a Redeemer. All of us need a much greater king than we can vote in or keep in. We all need a much greater king than is on offer just among us. It's really important for us to know that. Um, We need to turn to him, but with hope, because even as a failure myself, um, um, I mean, the only thing I'm consistent at is being inconsistent. You know, sometimes my spiritual life looks like this on a graph. And hallelujah, though, the Lord uses people like David and Solomon. And And the last line of that chapter is, the, 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 the kingdom was established. And it's God's choice of a kingdom. We know that because we already read the verses where God chose Solomon. Israel's king was old, cold, and bedridden. Adonijah was a greedy opportunist, fixated on gaining power for himself. Solomon has a great start in some ways, but even now, we already see him sort of doing some of the same stuff that David did and that Joab did. And he's got another guy, Benaiah, that he's making do what Joab did. So it's already telling us there's darkness, there's brokenness there, but God's kingdom will be established despite all of that. God's kingdom will be established despite undesirable circumstances and unseemly events, just like the ones we just read about, just like the ones we see in our own world as well. God's kingdom will be established in spite of the earthquake, in spite of the tsunamis, in spite of the cancer, in spite of the pandemic. God is in control of human history. And we can, even in the midst of all of the storm raging, even in the face of all the giants we have to face, we can see the battle as belonging to us or to the Lord. We can trust in our boats and our own ability to navigate the Sea of Galilee, or we can say, no, wait a minute, we got the Messiah in our boat. Let's appeal to him and see what he will make out of this, whether it's whether the outcome The physical outcome is our choice or not. God's kingdom will ultimately be established by one greater than King David and greater than King Solomon, and his name is Jesus. Hmm. These events in 1 Kings chapter 2 were a foreshadowing of another day, an even greater day. As this, we see this transition of power from David, now it's Solomon. And some people think of Solomon only as the wisest and wealthiest but man, he's kooky. 100, 700 wives and 300 concubines. I mean, he's off the charts. It all goes to his head. He's, you know, he, he's, just, he, he's already starting to do things that you kind of go, I, I, can't, I just can't see that as the right solution, you know? Um, but we'll see, we'll see him just like us going before the Lord, seeking wisdom. And look forward to that. That'll be a a highlight, really, in the story of Solomon. David and Solomon had plenty of power, plenty of authority, knowledge, and wisdom. But without righteousness and without faithfulness, they could never become the king that we all want and we all need. You see, that's the difference with Jesus and all these other ones. Power, Jesus has all authority and all power in the entire, uh, all of reality. He made that claim in the gospel (laughs) records. All authority has been given to me. And then he made these kinds of claims. And when I, he, he made the claim that he will return and set things right. That means he knows what's right. And that means he intends to do something about it. Again, rejoice in King Jesus. Put your hope and your confidence and trust in your faith in King Jesus. Christ is everywhere throughout the Old Testament. It speaks of him explicitly and implicitly. In promises, patterns, types, hints, and images... Through these various ways, the Old Testament reveals and anticipates the richness of his character, his work, his life, his glory, his hope, his might, his love, his suffering. 
his wisdom, and so much more. And it does this all before the historical event of his incarnation. Scott Redd is the president of um, uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., a good friend of a bunch of us here on staff, and uh, was just here for the Singh Conference. We had a great time to chat and talk a little bit and uh, told him we were going to be uh, studying Second Kings, or First and Second Kings. He was very, very excited about it, and uh, I thought he really hit it right there. Christ is throughout the pages of Scripture. He even claimed that in Luke 22, that all those Scriptures point to and find their fulfillment in him. Another good friend is Chavin Wax. He'll be here for one of our biblical thinking events on October 4th. He says, stressed, scared, anxious, distracted? Remember King Jesus. Take time to avert your eyes from everything else and look squarely at him. Look to his perfect life in your place. Look to his death on the cross for your sins. Look to his res- resurrection victory. Look to his exaltation as king. Look to his promise to come again. That's just simple gospel advice to us, isn't it? Yeah. So beautiful. I'll close with this Keller quote, and, um, and then I want us to uh, sing and respond to our, our great king. Uh, Keller says, Jesus' miracles, they're not just proofs that he has power, but also wonderful foretastes of what he is going to do with that power. His miracles are um, not just a challenge to our minds, but a promise to our hearts that the world we all want is coming. Yeah. Listen, no matter what may happen with all the earthly leaders of our nations or of our churches for that matter, this much is true. We will always be looking for a better king until we finally turn to the king of kings, to Jesus and ask him to be the king that no one else could ever really be. Jesus is the king of redemption history. He is the only one powerful enough, the only one wise enough, the only one good enough. And he is kind, and he is waiting for you to turn to him. He's worthy. Let's praise his name. Will you join me in prayer? Thank you, Lord, uh, for this passage. And although we don't understand all of it, um, we have these, these gaps of 3,000 years, Lord. Uh, we have these cultural gaps. We have these religious gaps. We have these um, tradition gaps. And when we read stuff like this, sometimes it, it uh, offsets us a little bit or, or uh, unnerves us in some way. But I hope, Lord, for each and every one of us, that what we'll see shining throughout all of these pages is how much we need King Jesus. Um, Whether we lived 3,000 years ago or we live now, we have the same need. We need you as our king because of who you are. You're the only one worthy. And so we lift up our empty hands of faith And we raise our eyes to heaven. We raise our voices to heaven. And we say, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing in response to the word this morning. Sing of our great king. Can't 
find yourself uh, curious, more curious about Jesus, would like to know him as your Lord, your Savior, your King. I want to encourage you, our prayer team gathers at that back corner there after each and every worship service, and I want to encourage you to head back there as we dismiss. Uh, those folks would be glad to talk with you about the gospel, pray with you if you're here today and you have any kind of need whatsoever. Uh, those folks would love, it's an honor and a privilege for them to be able to pray with and for you, so I want to encourage you to do that. Some of us will be up front here as well if you'd uh, rather ch chat with us on your way out. Um, I'm to remind you as well that uh, Meet and Connect, the very first of our Meet and Connects, will be right after this service at... Uh, Right, well, just right after, right? Head on down to the TVC offices, which are right below the chapel here. And this is for folks uh, who are either visiting for the first time or maybe you've just been coming for a few weeks, you've never met any of the staff, you'd like to just connect a little bit with somebody. We'll have a few of the staff will be down there and uh, they'd be happy to uh, welcome you and chat with you just a little bit. The first floor below the chapel in just a few minutes, okay? Let's have our, uh, let's sing our um, doxology together and then we'll have our benediction, okay? Praise God from
It sounds so beautiful to hear you sing this. Now may Almighty God make you faithful to his calling, cheerful in his service, and fruitful in his kingdom. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost be upon you. May that blessing flow through you like a mighty river to all of those to whom he will send you this afternoon, this evening, and the rest of this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of the Lord. fashion worlds to his design hello my sweet friends happy sunday i'm so happy to see you have you guys had a good week have you been working on your fruit of the spirit journals hey don't worry you could always catch up so work on it as you can as you have time and with your family if you can all right it's so much better to do it all together so have we been loving our neighbors sometimes easy Sometimes not. Have we been searching for joy, looking for joy in everything that God has given to us instead of being grumpy, turning away and saying, but what has God given to me? Let me see. Let me see God. And that's when I have joy, right? Have you worked on peace this week? Have you looked at people through God's eyes? Oh, it's so much better. So much better to see people the way God sees us, isn't it? Have you learned to forgive and forget? I've had some people that have had to forgive and forget me this week, and I'm so glad. They haven't forgot me. They, forget, they forgave me, and they forgot what they had to forgive me for. Um, what about, have you helped other people shine this week? All right. So you guys, we've made it through love, joy, and peace. Let's do our hand motions just so we make sure we remember. Are you ready? Here we go. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control ours we are ready pull out your journals and turn to the yellow pages page 22 and it says a big patience across the top all right i wish one of you could be reading this verse for me but i'm going to read it for you but read it out loud all right get your family together and read this verse out loud it's from proverbs which it's always a good day to read a proverb all right here we go proverbs 19:11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. Hmm. Does wisdom just come like you're born with wisdom? No. It takes some work, doesn't it? It takes some life living to get some wisdom. And then it says, it is to his glory to overlook an offense. All right. Those are two kind of different things, so we're going to talk about both. All right. So in your journal here, in bold letters, you might see that it says, smart kids use patience so a man's wisdom gives him patience so i translated that to you for smart kids use their patience all right they don't hold it back they use their patience and so i was trying to think what would be the opposite of smart kids now all of you guys are very smart kids but if you were going to not use your wisdom and you were going to not use patience you would be something else so i thought who could i quote and i thought why not buddy the elf so if you are not going to use your wisdom you will be, as Buddy says, a cotton head and ninny muggin, right? Don't be a cotton head and ninny muggin. We want to use our wisdom and be smart kids. All right, here we go. You like how it's fall so we could talk about elf already? All right. So the next part talks about patience. And um, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, how do we learn wisdom? We could read the Bible, right? And so I brought out two different stories that I wanted to share with you really, really quick. Two guys that had to use some patience. First one, David. All right, now you guys remember when we studied David and when Samuel came and he came to a city where David lived. Does anybody remember that city, what it was called? I'll give you a clue. 
It's called the city of David in the Christmas story. Bethlehem, right? So they lived outside in the hill country um, close to Bethlehem. And so Samuel came and he was going to anoint David and say he was going to be king, right? God had given a message to Samuel. And David, they went through all the different brothers. And finally, at the end, there was David. And he was out in the field with his sheep. And they brought him in. And Samuel said, you have been chosen king. What did David do? Did he get to just go to the palace right away? No. Nope. He had to have patience. He actually went back out with the sheep. And I think you guys will remember, he learned. He learned how to be a good leader by being with those sheep, didn't he? All right, shepherds, they learned so much. So he had to have a lot of patience. It was many years. He went through a lot before he was going to be king. He had to have some patience. The other one I was thinking about was Joseph. All right, do you remember he had those dreams? And he dreamt that my brothers will kneel down to me, bow down to me. Did that happen right away? No, a matter of fact, he got thrown in a pit. He, he went through a lot. He was thrown in jail. He went through a lot, and he had to be very patient till the time when his brothers did come to him. And he was, they did bow down, but he was able to help them. All right, so having wisdom and using that patience was so good in both those stories, okay? So in your journal, it says here to list some things in your life that you have had to wait for. And, you know, you guys are still young. You may not have had to wait for too much, but think about those. And moms and dads, I think this would be a great time to talk about your family history and think about what are things in your family that you've had to wait for, but in the end, you've seen how God uses those things. All right. So I was thinking about it in our family and, you know, Mr. Chris and I had to wait a lot longer than we wanted to, to have our first baby, Isabella. All right, so we waited and waited and waited, and finally she was born, and it was such a blessing, and we were so grateful to God. And then, a few years later, three and a half, we were going to have Isaiah, right? And we were so excited. So I was thinking about Bella. Think about Bella. She was actually blonde, about this tall, three-year-old, and she was asking me every day, when is Isaiah going to come? When is Isaiah going to come? She was not being very patient. All right. Every single day she would ask, when is Isaiah going to come? When is Isaiah going to come? So finally, one day we were out in the garden like we would be. And I pointed at some tulips and I said, Bella, when those tulips bloom, that's when your brother's going to be here. Well, guess what? God is so cool. On the day Isaiah was born, those tulips bloomed. That was such, it was just such a beautiful thing for me to see how God blessed her patience, right? God blessed us and showed her that, yes, it was time. Just like her mom had said, she stopped asking me every day. She just waited for those tulips to bloom. And on the day he was born, they bloomed. But guess what else happened? They bloomed two more times. These were not, these were not really strong tulips. They didn't bloom every year. And I think they were probably for northern area and not our area. They were really pretty. They were white and had green stripes, but they've only bloomed a couple of times. They bloomed when Isaiah turned 13, when he became a teenager, and then they bloomed again when he turned 18, when he became an adult. I just look at that story and I think about God was there, and he was there as a reminder. Be patient. I've got you. Be patient. I've got you as a teenager. Be patient. I've got you as an adult right? And those tulips blooming. It was just such a beautiful sign. So ask your mom and dad, are there stories in your family that just remind you of when you had to be patient and wait for something? But then boom, there it is. All right. Grandparents are also really good to ask. And so I thought I would share a little grandparent story. This is Chuck Swindoll. He wrote these books for his grandchildren, which I always love. It's called Big Eddies in the Bible. And each one of them is told from a bear's perspective. So there's stories about real life, but inside the story, there's a short version that is a Bible story. And so I'm just gonna read the tiny little part because of time today, um, just to give you a little bit of this Bible story, but it's inside a whole nother story about the bear families. This one is about Martha and Mary. Martha loved to have friends for dinner. She carefully planned each meal. She was very organized. She worked hard to prepare her food but the problem was she worried about every detail. Are you ever worried about things? Me too sometimes. She wanted everything to be just perfect. Martha and her sister Mary especially enjoyed having their good friend Jesus to their home. Could you imagine having Jesus over for dinner? So fun. And Jesus liked to visit with them and their brother Lazarus. 
One time, while Jesus was visiting their home, Mary became so interested in what Jesus was saying that she stopped everything and just sat down and listened to Jesus talk. She learned many things through her, the stories he told. Mary was encouraged by Jesus' words. Can you imagine just sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him tell stories? Wow. As Jesus told the story to Mary, Martha, she continued working in the kitchen alone. Martha waited for her sister to return to the kitchen. And after a while, Martha became upset. She began to fret. She wondered why Mary was not helping her prepare the meal. Finally, Martha became impatient. The opposite of patient, right? She thought, where is Mary? What is taking her so long? I need her to help me. Usually if your sentence ends with me, it's probably not good. Why is she wasting time while all I, while I do all the work? I wish she would hurry back to this kitchen. Finally, Martha looked into the room and to her surprise, there was Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha could hardly believe her eyes. She decided to speak to Jesus about Mary. She marched in and blurted out, Lord, don't you care that I have to do all this work by myself while Mary is sitting there doing nothing? Tell my sister to get up and come back to the kitchen and help me. <laughs> Jesus surprised Martha with his words. He said, Martha, please stop worrying. Be patient. You are upset over too many little things. Mary is doing the right thing. She's sitting here listening to me, and that's exactly what she should be doing. And so should you. Awesome. So the second part of our verse here where it talks about um, it brings glory to overlook an offense. Mary kind of offended Martha, right? But who was doing the right thing? It was Mary. And so the second page, guys, page 23, go through that story again and just answer those questions and take a look. You know, it's... It's pretty easy to offend, especially your family members sometimes, but it's such a blessing to overlook that offense. So write down some answers in there when that's happened to you, how you did it. I know you guys are really good at this. But before we leave, I just wanted to talk to you about one more thing. I was thinking about, you know, we love to have lots of art in our house and I love the art that's by our friends. Pretty much all the art in our house is by our friends. And so I wanted you to look at these um, photographs. They're not paintings, they're photographs, all right, of these trees. And I was thinking about being patient. And I was looking at these paintings and I was thinking, you know what? At one time, those trees were tall and green. At one time, they maybe even had leaves on them they maybe even had a bird's nest in them. But now, look at them. They're just glorious and beautiful, right? It took a long time for those trees to look beautiful like this. But did they look beautiful all along? It, every step of the way, they had beauty. I hope that God can show you how that when you have to be patient, every step of the way, He's doing something with you. Just like these trees, he's doing something to help you grow, to help you learn, to help you gain wisdom, and to help you get closer to him. All right, so sometimes being patient is hard, but hang in there, grow just like these trees because you might end up really beautiful. And I'm gonna show you the last one that is truly beautiful. This was a tree. I hope you see the beauty in this just like I do. I love you guys, and I hope to see you this week every day. Have a great week. Oh, hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Church, let's sing this simple prayer together. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you'll bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away, no more tears. And one day you'll make
make sense of it all Jesus, one day every question resolved Every anxious thought left behind No more fear When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be Sing and shout the victory One day we will see face to face Jesus, is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed